So we're going to be talking about biological reinforcement and this idea of getting microbes out onto the plant surface and why that's important. And compost tea is one of those options. So I'm going to pass this around and know that when um, Marshall started brewing this tea last night, it smelled like nothing but fish emulsion. Okay? He put, um, let's see, two tablespoons of a gallon. This is an 80 gallon container, so you can do the math. That's you know, 160 tablespoons, um, and there are 16 tablespoons to a cup. So, quite a bit of fish emulsion. It smells like fish by now. It doesn't smell like fish anymore. You know, don't, know when you're making tea, you want it to smell like this. Basically, it smells like the healthy side of a stream. And that's how you know that your tea is done. This tea um, is particularly carefully made to try and reproduce the tea we made last year, which two times in a row gave us one time 100% kill of late blight, and the second time like a 99% kill of late blight. Totally accidental, and it had everything to do with when the tea was applied it was at the very end of the spraying cycle, which took many hours. The tea was getting old, and he then refed it more fish and more molasses. And that's something he had never done before. And then with that interaction, we got a kill. And we think it was basically a, a flush of bacteria. But we're just gonna keep trying to reproduce it so you can never get to a point where it's reliably doing that. And we use it all the time, and we see major um, changes in um, the plants immediately when we spray them. It's as if, I don't know if people, what I, the example I give is, anybody get a chance to take a whiff? Um, the difference like, that you may see if you pay attention in how plants have grown after a full moon. You know, ever notice that there's like this kind of a burst in growth, the plants are more vigorous and a little bigger and all. Similar kick will happen from doing this. You know, they get a feed um, with this. Usually we then add um, more fish back in similar ratio to give a feed. Because all the fish, and people get that wrong all the time, they go, well, yeah, I'm feeding it. I gave it that fish when I made the tea. That's all gone. The microbes ate that. What you got in exchange for that fish was exponentially more microbes, many, many more microbes. If you want to then feed too, then you add more fish, more nutrients back in, and you feed at a time of day when the stomata are open. In the cool of the day, there's now research that's saying the best time is it as late in the evening as you're willing to stay up. The later in the evening, the better. You know, so that's that's what we're trying to accomplish here. So we're doing the tea for maximizing the fertility in the soil, maximizing the microbial activity in the soil, maximizing the activity and the life on the leaf, and as a vehicle for feeding the plants. And we find we get more, and I don't really understand this really why, but we find we get more, maybe because they're making it more readily available, more of a nutritional jump applying tea foliarly with the fish than we do if we just apply fish. And we also use maxi crop, by the way, in our foliar feed. We don't use in our tea, we used to use the northern kelp meal, but we use maxi crop. We would prefer to get a mix of fish and, and seaweed, but we have a local source, browns, um, which is from local trout, so we try and use that. You got a question, Amy? Molasses. Molasses? You molasses? Yes. In the tea group? Yep, to feed the microbes. That's for the bacteria. The um, fish and the seaweed and you know we use azomite but you could use rock dust and indeed i should we should be trying a batch now um john nilson's real into um rock dust that is um uh, very paramagnetic and says so that's even more dynamic so we'll probably try, he has found a, a source for the best that we can get around here and we'll probably try some of that in one of the one of the future batches Talking about local locally available things what do you feel about nettle tea I think nettle tea is a, is a powerful one. What I've learned is both nettle and comfrey, if I bubble them here from now till the cows come home, they won't break down. If I just put them in there, they just kind of keep their integrity and not much comes out of them. I tend to need to do a, um, an anaerobic pre-ferment and get them broken down, then put it in here and bring it aerobic, you know, and then that, you know, that seems to work great. And that could be a replacement for um, fish, you know, it's very high nitrogen, you know. We actually haven't come to terms with where we want to put nettles. It's a delicate decision, you know? I mean, it's, it's a wonderful resource, but it also can be considered a bit of a um, invasive and painful 
You just have to plant it here, and nettles decides where it wants to put nettles. Yeah, well, we do have one little patch <laughs> we found, which is found planted itself here, but it's not going to go anywhere because it's very alive right there. It's not going to get to take over. So we're going to have to, you know, help it to find a place. That, and we don't have much comfrey out yet, but we want much more comfrey out too. Um, any questions? And by the way, we cover how to make the tea in quite a bit of detail on the video Soil Fertility Systems Part 1, which is one of the many videos we have online. So you can go there and see how to do it. There's instructions on how to do a little five gallon brewer, which for most people, that size is fine. You know, we're doing a lot of acreage with this, so we go bigger. But the little five gallon one really allows you to throw tea together anytime. You, know. you have to aerate it. If you're making the kind of tea we make, you aerate it. You can make anaerobic teas, but they're pretty different, and I don't really feel qualified to talk about how to use them. I used to use them a lot, but I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't get much trouble. They worked fine, but um, now I'm paying a lot more attention to what's going on microbially, and I wouldn't recommend doing anaerobic teas without talking to someone that knows how to use them. You, know, you do some anaerobic teas, though, right? Just as ground spray. Just as ground spray, yeah. I don't know that I'd put anaerobic on the leaves. So I certainly did water it on top of things, and it didn't hurt things ever, but I've since learned that I might have been lucky. Make, there are complex acids and um, alcohols that happen in the anaerobic fermentation process, which can be phytotoxic, can be bad for plants. So you just want to pay attention if you're doing it that way. Though certainly comfrey and um, many other plants probably, but comfrey and nettles are pretty famous for how good a tea they make. And that's usually done anaerobically, but you can do them anaerobically and then send them. I've done that and it works fine. Send them into an aerobic situation. You give them enough air and then they'll go aerobic. Do you think it's generally just fine to have an anaerobic comp comfrey tea that you're using just at the base of the plant? Well, I never had any problem when I did it, you know, that's for sure. Any other questions? Okay, that was the compost tea break. So coming off that whole business about soil fertility, let's go back to the rhizosphere and back to the, the understanding that it's really about the biology. Um, and I have this one concept that when we are really after nutrient density in our fruit, by which I mean, you know, rich with vitamins, good stuff for us, and not just food stuff, but also medicinal compounds, it so totally equates to the life density in the soil. And that life density wants to be fungal.